So I am uh, really excited to share with you what we do in my lab. So uh, I am a statistician by training, and I am interested in all things uh, proteomics, uh, mass spectrometry, and in particular, quantitative aspects of that. And so uh, today I would like to share with you two different areas that we, we have in our lab. So one is more statistical in nature, where we work with quantitative proteomic experiments, and we try to quantify one protein at a time and detect proteins that change in abundance. And the other is kind of going more towards the function of the proteins, trying to understand how these proteins actually work together, in particular from the perspective of predicting outcomes of interventions. And of course, the, the hope is that as we go, these two uh, see I'm actually quite uh, connected to each other. So the first part, I will tell you about the effort in our lab, which is called MS STATS. MS stands for mass spectrometry, STATS stands for statistics. And this is a effort which has been ongoing in the lab for quite a few years. And essentially it started with a simple question, which proteins change in abundance between conditions? So let's say healthy and disease, which proteins are up or down regulated between two conditions? And very quickly we realized that even though the question seems quite simple, from the statistical perspective, it is actually not so easy. So first of all, there's all kinds of complexity based on the biological side of things. So beyond just healthy and disease, we can have factorial experiments, which have many factors, paired design, where we have a subject maybe healthy and the tumor biopsy taken on the same subject, or maybe a temporal study where we repeatedly collect measurements on the same person or a same uh, cell line. So from, from the statistical perspective, this implies very different structure of variation, different structure of uncertainty, and we need to recognize that. Also beyond uh, just relative quantification, we may want to ask a question, uh, what is the relative abundance of a protein in a particular sample, which we can use maybe as input to clustering or some machine learning method, et cetera. So we set out to address these questions. Now, at the same time, as we kind of work with mass spectrometric workflows, there's also a substantial variety there. So there are different types of acquisition. So there is data dependent acquisition, data independent acquisition, selected reaction monitoring. Again, all of these acquisition types, they imply different stochastic structure in the data. But even before we collect the data on the mass spectrometer, there's also different types of sample preparation, in particular label free versus label based. And again, it creates some particular aspect that we need to address. And so in addition, also these instruments can be uh, used to answer questions other than uh, regarding the proteins, such as post-translational modifications, changes in structure, and we also work uh, with that. Now, when the data come out of the instrument, it actually looks quite complex. There are many signals usually recorded in various proprietary formats. And the first task is to locate peaks in the spectra, identify uh, the spectral features, what are the molecules behind the spectral features, uh, quantify them, uh, map them between mass spectrometry runs. This is actually quite complicated. And there are people who do this much better than we do. So we don't do any of that. So we work with these tools which process the data. Instead, what we do, we take this data and we work on the statistical uh, modeling. But because there are many tools and different groups, you know, they work with different instrument types, different protocols, et cetera, we try to be as inclusive as possible. And we essentially have converters which work with open source tools, and academic tools, tools in industry, and we work very closely with most developers of these tools. And so our converters from these tools to kind of statistics ready format, they're more than just, you know, rearranging the data. They also do data cleaning, quality control, and other things. So the core of the work is here. It is the actual statistical analysis. So how can we develop models which account for all of this complexity upstream in, you know, situations where our users do not necessarily know enough statistical methodology to set up appropriate models for themselves. So we need to automatically recognize uh, the structure of the experiment and fit the right models on one hand. And on the other hand, these models, we fit them over and over for each protein, one protein at a time. And there are all kinds of numeric issues which occur when we do it long enough. So it also has to be stable numerically, et cetera. 
And so beyond that, we also have additional efforts such as method validation, for example, system suitability, uh, quality control, assay characterization in terms of figures of merit, such as limit of detection, limit of quantification. And of course, the question we're being asked most as statisticians is how many replicates do we need for huge experiments? So we also work on that. So starting from a very simple question, it turned out to be a really uh, substantial effort. And MS stats is in fact uh, the name or the umbrella name for a open source software. It's not, so we do everything in R just historically and in Biconductor, but MS stats is not a package. It's actually a family of packages at this point. So there's a series of converters from different tools and a lot of work went there because also the files are very large. And so we have to work with the data which do not fit in memory. We have to have efficient data structures and this is in place. And then there's MS stats for label free approaches, MS stats TMT for labeling, MS stats for post translational modifications. On the back end of things, so we have an AWS system which does testing over many data sets every time someone in the group touches the code. And also for the larger than memory data, on the front end, we have an MS stats shiny interface, which is also quite nice because it means that if you don't know R, you can use with the graphical uh, use it with a graphical user interface. And what is important is that uh, beyond just clicking and choosing options, every time we choose to make we'll make any selection with the interface in the back end, uh, the shiny app will create the R script that corresponds to your analysis, so that you can use this R script for documentation of what you did. And you can also analyze a small subset of the data to make it interactive and then run this same script on a larger file. So there are really different ways to uh, interact with that. And before I go any further, I need to acknowledge the people who actually do this work. So Mina Choi was the original leader of MS Stats. Um, Ting has done a lot of work for MS Stats TMT. Uh, Mateusz is the main developer now. So if you ask questions, he's most likely to respond. Uh, Devon has been working on both PTM and Shiny side of things, and Melanie has been leading the integration of MS Stats with the Galaxy uh, project so that you can also, in fact, now access most functionalities uh, of MS Stats through Galaxy as well. So what I would like to do today is just to illustrate what kind of statistical thinking goes into, um, into this work. And I will illustrate this in a special case of experiments with uh, multiplexing. So multiplexing means uh, labeling. So in this case, it's chemical labeling. We attach small molecules to peptides. So, sorry. Uh, ah. <laughs> we, uh, we attach, small, so first of all, we take the proteins, we digest them into peptides. Then we um, attach small molecules uh, to these peptides so that the sample of origin corresponds to a mass shift the mass known, the known mass of this small molecule. And then we mix them together and then we acquire all of these samples together in a single mass spectrometry run. So here is the peak corresponding to a uh, peptide from any source. And then we fractionate this biological material further. We have multiple peaks which have the corresponding mass shifts. And so now we can use this reporter ions to quantify the abundance of the peptide in each of the uh, original sample sources. So that's uh, the setup. And so how does it affect the statistics? Well, it actually is quite complicated because this is what one data set would look like. So here we have multiple mass spectrometry runs. We have 15 runs. Each panel is a run. And so within this run, we have several channels. So these are these uh, different reporter ions. So uh, these are the channels. Uh, vertical lines separate different conditions. This is actually a uh, controlled mixture. So this corresponds to the true amount of the protein in the sample. So the lines here correspond to all the features. So all the peptide ions of this protein. And what we see is that within one run, we have multiple features, but the number of features varies between the runs. For example, this feature is present in this run, but absent from this run and absent from other runs. So there is a lot of variability in terms of what is quantified between the runs and also some variability of what is quantified within the run. And occasionally we have some missing values within the run, like for example here. And so our objective is to take this information and aggregate this in a way that will 
summarize all the sources of variation and uncertainty and will distinguish what are the changes in abundance which are specific to the original conditions versus what are the artifacts of random variation. So just to illustrate the workflow that uh, goes into that is, well, we need to do some normalization to make sure that the intensities are actually comparable. Uh, so for that, we have several uh, steps. So the first is spectrum level normalization here for each run is the log intensity of all the proteins, all the peptides, everything we observe. So we see that the box is kind of not quite horizontal here because there is some differences in labeling efficiency, how much labeling um, was, uh, was done, et cetera. So we can equalize either the medians or the entire boxes between uh, the channels because we can assume in large scale discovery experiments that the majority of proteins do not change in abundance only small part does. But now this is a global normalization meaning applied to all the proteins together. So then we can now consider one protein at a time. So these are the features of one protein in different runs. So we'll apply some kind of summarization. We use uh, two key median polish as a robust version of summarization and has some censoring piece there which accounts for missing values. So now we can compare the abundances of uh, samples of the protein between samples within each run, we still cannot compare different runs because different features correspond to different peptides in the, in the run. And so the third aspect is protein level normalization. So this is where we typically have experimental designs which have some reference channels, meaning these are channels that do not have any known biological variation. These are the same samples which are available in every mixture, in every run. And so these samples, we know that if they shift up and down in their intensity, this is due to the technological artifacts and not to the biological variation. And so we equalize these um, reference samples, reference channels, and we apply the same shifts to the uh, endogenous features of the same run. So this accounts for the fact that we do not necessarily have the same peptides in different runs. And so after that, it's modeling and inference. And this is really what I would like to focus on so now that we have everything is comparable between channels and also between runs, I just want to illustrate how statistical thinking actually is quite important in terms of understanding what, what is the biological change with, of interest versus what is the technological or some other artifact and how we can account for that. And so the point here is that statistical inference uh, depends on the experimental design. So very briefly, right, if we just step back and say, okay, label free experiment we have one peak for healthy one peak for disease and we have many peaks like this in the healthy group and many peaks like that from different subjects in the disease group we can do something like a t-test right so this will be our difference in the means between the two groups so this is what we call a signal right and this is the noise so this is the variation associated with the signal so you can think of a t-test as a signal to noise ratio if in fact there is no difference between the groups, we can compare the signal to noise ratio to student distribution with some degree of affinity. I'm saying this just so that we are on the same page because most methods for any type of experiment, um, not all, but like a vast majority that are currently used in proteomics are essentially based on this kind of signal to noise ratio. And what is different between the different methods is how we define the signal and how we define the noise. And well, what are the corresponding degrees of freedom? So again, this is not all the methods, but really many of them. And so the challenge for us when we move from a label-free experiment like this to a label-based experiment, we need to characterize the signal, we need to characterize the noise and the degrees of freedom. And so this will allow us to see what is changing between, uh, between the samples. And this depends on the design. And this is just a intuitive illustration. So let's say we have two mixtures. And let's say we have a group comparison experiment. So we have two conditions and we have three subjects in this mixture from one condition, three other subjects from the other condition in the same mixture. And then we have another mixture which does kind of another set of replicates. So I think it's intuitive that, that the replicates acquired within one mixture are probably more similar to each other than the replicate between the mixtures. Because, well, that's why we multiplex, right? Within the multiplexing, we share whatever artifacts happen within the instrument, right? A separate mixture is a separate labeling, separate data acquisition, right? So 
when we construct that signal to noise ratio that I was just talking about, so we probably want to separately characterize the variability within the mixture, separately characterize the variability within the other mixture, then combine that, right, and then compare the conditions. So this is what we would want to do. So we don't want to kind of uh, interchangeably use within and between the mixture. Now, this is what happens when instead of group comparison design, we have a time course design. So now we have in one mixture, we still have six replicates, but now we have three time points on the same subject. And this is three other time points on the same, some other subject, right? And the same second for the second mixture. And now our question is comparing the times. So this is a repeated measurement, uh, repeated measures design. And this is a very good design because if we want to compare times, it is much more effective to compare this within the same subject because now the subject serves as their own control, right? We see how things changed, protein abundance changed in time for one person, how the protein abundance changed in time for another person, etc. right? So we probably want to distinguish the fact that we have a variation in time within one person. Then we have a variation in time in other person, which will have extra source of variation because it's a different person. But all of this in one mixture is more similar to each other than similar structure in another mixture. So now we have two sources of variation. We need to characterize the variation within subject. We need to characterize, this is the variation of interest, the variation between subjects within the mixture. This is a biological variation, which is nuisance variation. And then also the variation between the mixtures, which is an extra layer of technical variation. And so, same idea, we will, come, we will separately characterize each source of variation and integrate that. And in this case, the standard error, so again, the denominator here will be smaller in this design than in this design because we have subjects being uh, their own controls. But in reality, the experiments we have to deal with most often is a combination of these two. So we have time, repeated measurements in time, but we also have multiple conditions. I don't know, maybe knockout and wild type or something like that, right? And we look at uh, measurements in time. And so now we have replicates of one subject in time are more similar to each other. Now there are differences in conditions, which are not just differences in people, but the fact that they come from different conditions. And of course, there are also differences in uh, mixtures. And so again, we need to build the signal to noise ratio by understanding like how we can compare, like combine the sources of variation which are closest to each other, integrate the sources of variation that are different, and then derive the signal to noise ratio that I was talking about. So this is, very, I, I won't do like much complicated statistics, but just to show how we actually think about this. So we think about this in a very classical way. So in um, statistics, this is called decomposition of variation, and it is often done with linear mixed effects models. Linear mixed effects models is actually not a model, but it's a very broad class. It's just an approach, essentially, right? It's a broad class of methods, and then the result of differences in how these mixed effect models are actually set up. And so we think about the total variation characterized between the subjects and within the subjects. Between the subjects, it means that some of them come from different mixtures, some come from different conditions. And this is the unexplained kind of non-additive variation of mixture and condition. And within subjects also, well, some of this is due to difference in time. And then some of this is due to this unexplained difference of time and condition or mixture and condition and so on. And so we can um, write this decomposition of variation and linear mixed effect models, such as this term serves as the essentially the denominator when comparing um, conditions. And then this term serves as the denominator when comparing uh, times. So this is just very briefly why it matters, right? So this is uh, this controlled experiment that um, I was showing earlier, right? So this is two mixtures. So yellow color is one mixture blue color is another mixture. Here we have different time points. So MS stats TMT implement this kind of various decomposition approach. Lima is just used for comparison. I'm not picking on Lima, but I know that many people use it. Lima cannot have more than two different sources of variation. And in fact, the second one has very strict assumptions. And so as the result, so I was just saying, right, comparing conditions has more variation than comparing times within a person, right? And so now if we look at that, so if we look at the degrees of freedom, 
So lemma does not recognize that comparing times has a different amount of information than conditions. It has different uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, in both cases, it actually overestimates the amount of information. And as the result, overfits to this comparison and detects it when it shouldn't. And so if we look, so this is for one protein. And in general, so here's the denominator for comparing times versus conditions. Usually comparisons of conditions are more noisy as they should be, right? But no relationship. Lima just applies some kind of linear transformation. And the degrees of freedom for Lima are always constant, but MS stats has more information when comparing times as it should be than when comparing conditions. So just to finish on that, clearly it is very important to have uh, data that allow us to benchmark these experiments. And I just want to highlight, if you do do proteomics, either experimentally or computationally, it is very important to make the data publicly available. So we worked very much on that and we teamed up with Massive and the Nuno Bandera lab at UCSD to develop an extension to Massive, which stores the reanalysis, analysis or reanalysis of quantitative proteomic experiments. So in addition to storing raw data, uh, we have essentially data structure like that, which stores details of identification, details of quantification, details of statistical analysis. And this can store information from any tool or any format that you work with routinely, such that if somebody, for example, is interested in developing a new statistical method, they can use the existing uh, identification quantification and focus on this part. Or if somebody, I don't know, develops new algorithm for identifying peptides, they can still reuse the other um, scripts, but they just have a new data structure with a different identification step. So I hope that this will be useful. So this was one part. So this is really important and it really speaks to me as a statistician because we're really trained in experimental design and in decomposing sources of variation. But what I've always found kind of limiting for me is the fact that we do this analysis for one protein at a time. And the output of our work is essentially a list of p-values. And for one protein, we have one p-value. And then it doesn't really tell us yet what happens more biologically, what, how does it relate to the biological function. And so we set out some maybe seven years ago or so to think beyond uh, the laundry list of proteins and trying to understand how these proteins work together. And there are two parts. So one is, okay, can we infer some kind of um, joint effort uh, from the data? And the other is, let's say we have this network either inferred or given from elsewhere. How can we actually use it effectively to understand more about the biological function? And so this is what I would like to illustrate uh, now. So I will use this example because it's simple and probably many of you are familiar with that, but it illustrates uh, what we're trying to do. So protein signaling networks. So cells detect signals by using small molecules like such as uh, phosphor molecules, right, etc. And so these cascades um, perform the regulation of biological functions. And so in this part, I am interested in understanding how we can infer this type of relationships from data. And maybe not necessarily from scratch, but maybe we have some idea on what is happening, I don't know, in one cell line and we want to learn about the, another cell line, or maybe we have this type of network for a healthy uh, subject, but we want to infer a similar thing for a subject with a disease where some of these ages are rewired somehow or uh, changed. So I will focus just as a small example on this cascade just to show you what we're trying to do here. So the goal is to actually infer this type of relationships from the data. So very traditional methods, right? So um, probabilistic graphical models. So the first step was to look at pairwise correlations between the three uh, proteins. So if we look at these pairwise correlations, they're all quite high because, well, these proteins regulate each other, right? So the second step is to try to re eliminate some of these edges as not being uh, informative. So in particular, we try to condition on the fact that we know one node, for example, here, so this is the relationship between ERK and RAF, and there is some association between them. Now, if I fix a particular range of MAC, so here I fix a particular range of MAC, and I zoom into this, this relationship is broken. It means that MAC tells me everything I need to know between RAF and ERK, and I do not need this extra edge. So this is called conditional independence, and we can eliminate this extra edge. 
So this is good and <clears throat> we'll use that, but the tricky part now is to orient these edges. So is the relationship going in this direction or in the opposite direction, etc. And for that, we need additional experimentation. We need to intervene on one node, for example, here, let's say we fix ERC. So we literally make ERC uh, fixed to a certain level in some way. So now ERC has no more correlation between RAF and MEC. And so we see that ERC is not correlated between RAF and MEC, but RAF and MEC, they still perform their function. There still is correlation. So this tells me that ERC is downstream of RAF and MEC, right? So the edge cannot go from ERC to MEC, but it goes in the other direction. So now we can take this further. And we can say, okay, if we have this graph that we start with, right, we have potential cascade, but I don't know in which direction the edges go. So I can do what I just described. I can target ERC. So, so these are my candidates, right? So these are all the possible directions. So I can target ERC, and now I know that ERC is downstream. So it eliminates this candidate network, and I have these two networks left. Now I can also target VAF. And now I see that if I target RAF, then there is no more regulation MAC and ERC, so I know that RAF is upstream. Okay, I resolve the whole thing. But what I can also do instead, instead of targeting ERC once and RAF after that, I can go ahead and start directly by targeting MAC. And because MAC is in the middle, I will see immediately that RAF continues to vary and ERC stops varying. So then in one step, I can resolve the entire network. So I can either have two interventions and resolve the network in two steps, or I can have one more effective intervention and resolve everything in one step only. And so this is what our project was about. How can we design interventions based on the prior knowledge of a network, maybe from a different cell line, maybe from a different condition, which would minimize the number of interventions and will resolve the directionality of this conditional independence graphs so that we can um, minimize the experimental cost and maximize the information. And so there's an algorithm, I don't have time to go over this, but maybe the important thing I will say is that we have essentially informative priors on the edges. So for example, from KEG, from Reactome, there are many knowledge bases these days. So if a related cell line or related condition has an edge present, so we will have a prior, which has two parts. One is the presence of the edge and the other is the orientation of the edge. So this can be more or less informative depending on how we set it up. And if we don't have, know anything, we can set up a non-informative prior essentially half and half. And so going back to this pathway, but now with uh, real data. So what we can do, we can compare for the number of interventions, what is the true uh, proportion of uh, edge discoveries if we do this randomly or with a non-informative prior. And then if we inform our target selection with some kind of prior, we are a lot more um, effective with that. So this was the first um, work for us trying to say, okay, this is how we could potentially uh, refine our models and infer the directionality of the graphs. And the second part is to say, okay, let's say somebody gave us a network, either by this approach or by some other approach from the literature. How can this network uh, be useful for us to understand how the system functions and we take it in the context of predicting outcomes of interventions so if we have some observational data and we now want to predict what happens if we intervene on a particular node how can we do that and i am particularly excited to talk about this here because it's a collaboration for several years now with jeremy zucker who is at pnnl and i think jeremy is also presenting at the conference so i am really excited to share uh, this aspect of work uh, here. So again, going back to our example, right, with this particular um, network. So what we can do now, let's say the graph structure is known. Somebody gave it to us one way or another. We can have some data which would allow us to actually quantify the relationship. So here, for example, RAF and MEC, so we can actually have experimental data um, and we can, well, here we have a lot of replicates. It doesn't have to be right and we fit some kind of relationship like a hill equation or even like a sigmoid or a straight line depending on what's meaningful and so now we can propagate the quantitative signals uh, along the network and so we can do it in different ways we can do it by a different uh, simulation so we can just say okay let's say here we fix max so what happens with ERC, right and we can just simulate from this quantitative relationships and we can make prediction so we can do it like this we can do it with like 
more complicated dynamic models. So the green uh, histogram in the back, that's what happens when we have a uh, direct simulation. But we can also do a counterfactual, we can ask a counterfactual question saying, okay, if we observed ERK and NEC without treatment, can we now leverage this data in ways which are more than just fitting this relationship to ask what would have happened to the same cells if instead we had fixed NEC? So observing things without the intervention, conditioning on the fact that we observe this data, and then ask question of what have been the parallel kind of outcome if we had in fact fixed NEC. And so uh, working with Jeremy and others, we have um, uh, came up with uh, this approach. And so what we see here is this, the estimation of the treatment effect in yellow on top. And this estimate is more precise than the estimate by direct simulation, because in a counterfactual statement, we condition on the day observed data, we inject additional information, and therefore we can be more precise. Moving on from that, we can ask ourselves, can we always do that or not? And the problem in proteomic experiments in particular is that we don't always get to control which proteins we measure. So here is one example, kind of very simple. We want to infer the effect of X on Y, but we have an unobserved confounder and we just happen to not have it in our data. So in principle, we cannot do much, except that if our network topology includes another node here, which is a mediator, then we can actually, it turns out, we can actually use this latent variable uh, setting with the mediator and still reliably estimate the outcome of the intervention on x to y. And this is kind of what shows here. If we don't have a mediator, then we can, you know, increase the number of replicates all we want, but our estimates of treatment effect do not approach the ground truth. But here, if we have a mediator with a, enough sample size, our estimates of the treatment effect actually converge to the ground truth because the network structure helped that. So this is the work by uh, Sarah Tahiri in the lab. And so applying this again to the SOS uh, and ERK uh, intervention. So if we, if we assume that EGF and IGF are latent confounders, which we do not have in the data, turns out we can still estimate the um, average treatment effect reliably, and it converges to the true values as the number of replicates increases, despite the fact that the latent variables in the model can even be mis misspecified. So here the orange boxes are estimates of treatment effect if the latent variables are specified correctly, and the blue ones are if the latent variables are specified incorrectly, because often we don't know what are the confounders in the system. So if we, we can recognize if the network structure supports that, not always, but in cases where it does support that, we can actually do that. And so going back to collaboration with uh, Jeremy, we can do it for more complex networks, and this is what our project was about so we can think now not just like all this uh, simple map cake cascade but think about more complex models in this case is a um, model of SARS uh, COVID uh, of a COVID infection right and the cytokine, cytokine storm as the molecular readout we have uh, these two proteins which are potentially targets of drugs this is our phenotype of interest and we can also ask a question what would happen if we intervene on one of these nodes and how it would affect cytokine storm with the understanding that there are many confounders in the system which are indicated by the dashed lines, which we do not observe. And so it turns out that again, by kind of simulating the scenarios with enough replicates, we can actually converge um, to the true estimates of uh, causal effects. So this is really important. And the final thing, uh, the most uh, recent uh, project is going back to this uh, network well if we don't need some of the nodes measured so they're latent but our network structure supports the estimation of causal effects if we don't need these nodes measured well maybe we can deliberately decide to not measure certain nodes for example if we um, do a targeted experiment and so if that's the case we can consider different sub networks we can consider uh, their costs maybe experimental costs associated with that and we can also play out how likely these subnetworks are to quantify accurately and precisely uh, the effect of the intervention. In this case, it's also intervening on source and uh, quantifying work after that. So to summarize, uh, what have we learned so far, right? So I had two fairly different parts of the project, of our projects in the lab, right? Uh, 
And so I think the obvious first uh, takeaway is that different questions require different methods, right? So we really have to think about what the question is and what the needs are and use different methodology. On the statistics side of things, we tend to work with one time protein at a time, class comparison. On kind of the functional side, right? It's more a machine learning and causal inference and we predict outcomes of interventions. What we also learned is that as method developers, we need to make sure that we account for experimental design in terms of replication, randomization, interpretability, characterization of uncertainty. And we're going in this direction now also more for systems biology uh, studies. And as tool developers mission, I think it's really important to make these tools accessible to scientists who do not have the statistics or machine learning expertise, tools that are scalable, enable reproducible research, and make tools and data publicly available. So we are a long way in this direction for all things MS stats, and we are just kind of starting out now in this kind of more systems biology and network uh, biology direction. But my hope is, like in a few years, I will be back and tell you how these things converge and how we can use proteomic data and MS stats to predict outcomes of interventions more um, reliably. So the last thing I want to do is to acknowledge people who actually did a lot of work. It's a much bigger list than fits in this slide, but I would like to. Um, highlight uh, maybe starting with uh, Mina Choi, who is now a Genentech, who was the original person behind uh, MS Stats. So Ting, uh, Devon, uh, Tsung Heng, and Mateusz, who are the current leaders, and Melanie, who are the current leaders of uh, MS Stats. And of course, uh, Jeremy and uh, Charlie, who are our fantastic collaborators um, for the systems biology side of things. And also, I want to um, acknowledge uh, Rudy Abersold and uh, Paula Picotti, who have been our collaborators on the MS Stats side from, for many years and who really contributed very substantially with their uh, insight and feedback to everything we've done so far. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that uh, it was uh, useful and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Professor Vitek. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Oh, we have Jeremy here too. Uh, so now we have time for questions. <laughs> Do we have any questions here? Okay, yes, we have one. Hi, this is Jason McDermott. Oh, that sounds weird in this room. Um, <laughs> From PNN now. Um, so great talk, really interesting, and I really liked your treatment of the statistics and the experimental design. And I wanted to kind of follow up in that kind of tying, well, maybe crossing both of your um, points there. You talked about proteomics and protein abundance determination, and then you talked about causal inference and, and kind of causal reasoning on networks. But you're talking about signaling networks. Um, you didn't talk about the kinds of data that might go into that. And so I'm wondering if protein abundance levels may or may not vary based on the signaling pathways that or the signaling mechanism. So could you speak a little bit to the kinds of, of limitations and the kinds of um, data that you might need to do that? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we're really in the very beginning of what is possible, right? And so currently, and I will be honest that most of the network uh, kind of projects, they are based on uh, synthetic data or data which we augment in different ways. You know, maybe there's some experimental data and some uh, a synthetic component for reason that you just mentioned. This said, there are like many connection points. One is that the methods that we develop, they're not specific to signaling networks. They can be regulatory networks or any other. Um, the important thing is the network topology and not like the nature of the molecules. So if we have networks which are more like regulatory or something else, so we can work with like transcription factors or some such, we can uh, work uh, with that on one hand, right? On the, other, on the other hand, there are also technologies which actually quantify activated proteins, right? Let's say they're phosphor, phosphorylated, right? So we can quantify phosphorylation with mass spectrometry, we can also do things which are not necessarily mass spectrometry related. So for example, antibody based method or like flow cytometry, right? So those things would be, um, uh, would be also feasible. And I think the frontier where like 
nothing has been done yet, but also there has been a lot of work in single cell uh, proteomics, right? And so this would allow us to kind of have more replicates, um, broader coverage, but quantifying PTM on single cell, I think it's just in the very early stages. So I don't think we are ready for that yet. So uh, kind of to summarize on the network side of things, the kind of machine learning technology is very general. And if there are networks which kind of regulate the abundance of the protein, then we can work with protein abundance. And if these are signaling networks, then we need to work with technologies or with experimental designs uh, that quantify activated proteins. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Anyone has any question, please? And the audience uh, online, do we have any question? No? No? Okay. Uh, I have a question. Um, have you tried and you think it's applicable the same kind of analysis for microbial communities? No, we have, we have not, but I think that there is definitely a possibility there. You know, I think that we really like to develop methods that are general and support many types of applications. and. We'll be most happy to, you know, apply what we do to the data that, you know, if anybody in the audience, you know, has some kind of, you know, biological question, experimental data, which may potentially fit, we'll be most happy to look into that. So we have done a lot of methodological work, but as far as, you know, connecting this to the applications, I think there is a lot of opportunities there, and we will be most happy to collaborate on that. 